Hello and welcome back to Murphy's Welcome to My World. This is a very special episode. This one I'm going to teach you how to operate a steam locomotive, like a real one, like the big ones, you know? I'm going to go through and I'm going to introduce you to the theory behind how a steam engine works. Then we'll go through and we'll have a look at all the appliances on the machine itself, the different things that make it function. From there I'll teach you how to fire a steam engine, which is actually a very fine art, the firing. I find it's a kick. And then after we get that taken care of, I'll show you how to drive the steam locomotive. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Come along, let's go have a look at how the theory of a steam engine functions. Let's take a look at the major parts of a steam locomotive. This part here, with the windows, is the cab. The cab is where the crew of the locomotive work. The crew consists of two men, an engineer who drives the train, and a fireman who tends to the fire. Directly in front of the cab is the boiler. The boiler has three main parts. Right in front of the cab is the firebox, and the firebox is where the fire is, and it heats the water in the center part of the boiler here. And in the very front of the boiler is the smoke box. The smoke box acts as a sort of filter to keep sparks and hot ashes from flying out of the smokestack and lighting the trees and fields on fire as the locomotive pass. The wheels underneath of the locomotive are grouped into three different types. The small pilot wheels in the front. Their job was to guide the locomotive in the turns and keep it from derailing. In the middle are the large drive wheels. Now some locomotives had drive wheels that were over six feet tall. And in the back here are the trailing wheels. They help support some of the weight as well. Now behind the locomotive is the tender. The tender is a special car pulled by the locomotive that carries extra water and the fuel such as wood, coal, or oil. Now this dome here on top of the boiler is called the steam dome. The steam dome is where the steam was collected from the boiler and sent to the two cylinders on each side of the locomotive. If we could look inside of the locomotive, we would see the firebox here with the fire in it. The heat and smoke from the fire traveled through dozens of pipes surrounded by water through the smoke box and out of the smoke stack. Here's a picture of what the firebox and the pipes would look like if you cut away the sides of the locomotive. The heat traveling through the pipes heats up the water in the boiler, turning some of that water into steam. The steam, which is under a lot of pressure, is collected at the top of the boiler in the steam dome. The steam then travels down a large pipe on each side and into two cylinders, one on each side of the locomotive. Inside the cylinder, the steam pushes on a piston, which is attached to a heavy connecting rod. That rod goes back and forth and makes the drive wheels spin. Now the cylinders is where the real work was done. So let's take a closer look at what's going on inside the cylinders. Each cylinder has two chambers. The top chamber contains a valve, and the bottom chamber contains the piston. The valve in the top chamber slides forward and backwards and allows the steam from the large pipe on the top to enter into the bottom chamber either in the front of the piston or in the back of the piston. Let's open up the throttle and see what happens. In this position, the valve allows steam to enter into the front of the piston. The force of the steam pushes the piston back. The piston drives the connecting rod backwards and the wheels turn halfway around. At this point, the steam in the bottom chamber is used up. The valve in the top chamber has also moved and now it allows fresh steam to enter in behind the piston. It also opens up a way for the old steam to escape. The escaping steam is what makes the chugging sound. This fresh charge of steam pushes the piston forward, which pulls the connecting rod forward as well, and the wheels make another half turn. Now we're back to where we started. The valve, again in the forward position, allows fresh steam to enter and the old steam to escape. And so it goes, back and forth, 
the drive wheels making a half turn every time the piston is pushed each way. Steam locomotives were so powerful they could take a train weighing several thousand tons from a dead stop to over a hundred miles an hour. And you will notice that there are no gears here like in a transmission of a modern vehicle. A steam locomotive doesn't need them. All right, now you have a pretty good idea of the theory behind how a steam engine works. Basically, you put some fire in, put some water in, heat it up, let it boil, catch the steam, and then make the steam do what you want it to do. Pretty simple concept, but really hard to make it function. What we're going to do now, we're going to go off to the machine and have a look at the appliances, all the extra machines on it that make the locomotive a worthwhile tool. And I'll tell you about the different individual things, and then we'll work from there. So come on, let's go have a look around the machine. Here we go. Of course, I couldn't possibly show you everything and tell you everything in one video. But I will give you a little bit of an idea of what most locomotives have and what they kind of look like, so you know what to expect when you show up for your Engineer for a Day program. And of course, most but not all locomotives have a tender. Some locomotives carry their fuel and water on the locomotive part, but most of them have a tender. So this one has oil and water. So you have a tender, and then you have the locomotive. This particular one is referred to as a light prairie, or another way to think of it, it's a 262. Two wheels up front, six drivers in the middle, and two wheels in the back. These little wheels in the back they're designed to carry the additional weight which as locomotives got larger and larger the fireboxes had to get larger and larger and you had to do something about that extra weight now this is a logging locomotive it was never designed to be a mainline passenger or freight locomotive it was designed for light track and tight curves so you have these trailing wheels to take care of the weight in the back and then you have your six driving wheels three on each side and then hiding behind that steam there are the two leading trucks two leading wheels I should say of the front truck and then notice all the valve gear what's interesting about a steam locomotive is that all of their parts are easily accessible and these are the leading wheels now you see that steam coming out of there this is the cylinder which produces the power to make the wheels go around and you want to remember that steam is nothing more than a different state of water. Steam is ultimately compressible where fluid water is not. You can get what's called a hydrostatic lock if you end up with fluid water in the pistons. So whenever we're sitting and whenever we're starting we open these drains basically and it allows a little bit of steam and all of the fluid water to come out. That way we don't have to worry about blowing the end of the cylinder clean off. There is of course a braking system on the locomotive. This is some of the valve gear to make the brakes work correctly. You don't under have to understand all the bits and pieces just to understand how to operate it which we'll tell you about later. Another important aspect is the reverser. The reverser is the gadget that allows the locomotive to either go forward or reverse. As of about, I think, 1932, Congress mandated that all locomotives above a certain weight would be required to have a power reverser. And that's what this is. This is the power reverser. It makes operating the locomotive a whole lot easier. It had gotten to the point where they were using what were referred to as strong arm or Johnson bars which is just a big long bar to take and operate the valve gear but these locomotives were getting so big you couldn't do it anymore then of course locomotives have to be able to couple to something so you can drag other cars around this is a coupler or a knuckle coupler this revolutionized railroading because once they were introduced and sometimes referred to as automatic coupler people didn't have to get between the cars to hook them together anymore all you have to do is from the outside 
lift that lever, it's called a cut lever, and that enables you to uncouple cars without having to get between them. And this is your valve equipment. This is what determines whether the locomotive is going to go forward or backwards. That power reverser we talked about a moment ago, it lifts or lowers this rocker arm, which is connected into the valve, which allows the steam to go to one end of the piston or the other. This is the magic involved with a steam engine right here. This is what makes it actually work. Keep in mind that these steam engines at the time were the rocket science. They were the epitome of engineering. And also keep in mind that at that time, all of this was developed by pencil, paper, and slide rule. Now this is a mechanical lubricator. What this does is force oil around different places. In particular, this one forces oil into the piston. So this would have steam oil in it. On our locomotives, we have four different kinds of oil plus grease. So you're going to have to get to know what goes where. Now on the top part here, that's the valve. And at the top of the valve, you see that little gadget screwed in the top? That's a snifter that keeps it from back suctioning. So the valve directs the piston which direction to go. And it's quite interesting understanding the timing involved with getting a locomotive to work correctly. Now these are a bi-directional piston, which means the piston will have steam on both sides alternating back and forth. That's what enables you to get four power strokes out of each rotation. Now we also have the compressor and these cooling fins that go back and forth. Of course, warm air holds more moisture than cool air and what we're trying to do is get the moisture out of the system. If you get moisture in the system, you can have that hydrostatic lock that I talked about or it can freeze or it just makes things rust and fall apart in the inside. So what we try to do is get the most amount of moisture out of the air before we put it into the brake system. Now you see that valve in the bottom? That valve in the bottom is so we can drain the water out of these accumulation tanks. And generally speaking, I drain them three or four times a day. Oh, and of course, gotta have a headlight. Actually, there's one in the front and the back. And don't forget the bell. The fireman's gonna be ringing the bell, well, a lot of the time. So you'll get to be friends with the bell. I mentioned the compressor. Well, here it is. This is operated by steam. We don't use steam in the brake system because of all the moisture. What we do is we use the steam to pump air up. And here's the rest of the, the, rest of the cooling fins, which I was talking about just a minute ago. This is a builder's plate. All steam locomotives had a builder's plate. It tells you a lot about them, where they came from, when they were built. They're a fun little thing. You'll notice on this particular locomotive, there are three domes in the top. They do different things. The front dome has sand, which we put on the rail anytime it's slippery. The middle dome is a steam dome where steam is collected. And then the after dome has sand in it also in case we're going backwards. So those are the domes. And of course, don't forget the whistle. You gotta have a whistle out here. So that's a basic little introduction to the outside. All right, now you have a pretty good idea of the way that a steam engine functions. You also have a pretty good idea of the appliances that you'd find on these steam engines. And keep in mind that each steam engine is going to have the same basic stuff, but it's going to look different and be in different places and function a little bit differently. So each time you're around a steam engine, you've got to get to know that particular machine. What we're going to do now, we're going to go into the cab, have a look around, look at the back head, the back of the boiler, Look at all the tubes and pipes and gauges and valves and levers and all this stuff. And I'll give you a basic introduction. Once again, keep in mind that this is one particular steam engine and each one will be a little different, but it will have all the basic same stuff. So come on, let's go inside and have a look around. 
course, the first thing you always want to look at is the pressure. Make sure it doesn't get too much. You want to keep track of the water. The hydrostatic lubricator, it lubricates the compressor. Down here is where you drain the water gauge to make sure there's no sediment in it. That's your atomizer. That's your blower. That turns the water on for your injector and this is a handle that makes it start. This is your oil valve. That's an important one for being a fireman. That's your damper. It allows more or less air into the firebox. Over here on the engineer's side you can drain your water gauge again and these are called tricocks. Another means of determining how much water is in the boiler. You have the independent brake that just turns on the locomotive and this is the train brake that handles all the brakes for the whole train. This is your power reverser. Allows the train to go forward or backwards. There is the water gauge for the engineer's side. Another pressure gauge there for the engineer. Of course you have the whistle right here. Got to be able to blow the whistle. Then of course we have the throttle. This makes it go. Further back you pull it the more steam, then you have the two brakes again, that's the train brake. Put a little brake on. Over here is the power reverser once again, makes it go forward or reverse. Down here we have the valve to open the cylinder cocks to drain the fluid out of the cylinders and of course we have a second injector here. And these are the gauges that tell you a lot about the brakes and what they're doing. Tells you the cylinder pressure, brake pipe pressure, main reservoir, and equalizing reservoir. When you get here we'll tell you all about which one's which and then of course we have another additional pressure gauge which is always one of the most important aspects every day. And then of course there's a lot of valves that turn on things like your injectors and your uh, different things which we'll be showing you when you actually get here. And of course there's the fire you got to keep track of. Always watching the fire. All right, you got a pretty good basic understanding on how a steam locomotive works. We also went through and talked a lot about the appliances and the add-on stuff that make it a worthwhile piece of machinery. What we're going to do now, we're going to go into the shop. We're going to go watch the guys fire it up first thing in the morning because if you don't fire it up in the morning, it's not going to work the rest of the day, is it? So come on, let's go into the shop. All right, here we go. And we need to set our priorities straight. First things first, got to start with that coffee first thing in the morning. It's going to be a long day and you got to have the energy. And don't forget, if you want a happy train crew, you want to make sure to have some donuts for them. Of course, the very first thing you want to do is open up the shop. We're going to be producing a lot of heat, smoke, steam. So we need to have some good ventilation. So you just take the time and make sure to clip these doors shut. The next thing, is you gotta go up and you gotta take the stack cover off. Most people that have been a fireman for very long at some point or another has forgotten this stack cover and if that's the case, oh what a mess it is. You'll fill smoke up everywhere. Now you'll notice that Ryan is putting the smoke stack cover right here onto the locomotive. We like to take it with us that way just in case we have to put it on again someplace we have to shut down. Okay the next thing you want to do is actually check inside of the firebox you're looking for any leaking stay bolts or cracked or broken fire bricks. Look around good make sure there's no problems in there and then of course you want to make sure there's pressure in the boiler, water in the boiler and then you want to blow out your atomizer and your blower get all the fluid water out of them. You want to check and make sure you have oil and that your damper's oil is open because if you don't have oil, it's not going to work. Okay, it's time to actually start thinking about starting the fire. There's a number of different things that you can put in there to burn. We like to use just plain old newspaper. Some people use cotton waste. And then, of course, you want to get a good fire going on a piece. Toss it in. From there, you want to open your oil up. Just a little bit, not too much, because we don't want a big pan fire. We don't want a lake of burning oil in there. And then you turn on your atomizer and your blower. You want to get that oil atomized into little tiny droplets. And you want to get that blower going 
so it's sucking the heat up through the boiler and up out of the exhaust up in the smokestack and you want to do it really easy you want just a little bit of a fire to start because it's easy to bring it up bigger if you get too much fire to start you'll end up with a big pool of burning oil at the bottom of the firebox and so you only move it just a little bit at a time just like one notch and it's better to have it a little bit too low at the beginning than it is too high remember that a fire needs oxygen heat fuel and a chemical reaction if the fire is not giving you what you want that means that one of those things is not correct so let's have a look are we getting a lot of black smoke no matter of fact we're getting just a little bit of gray smoke which is exactly the way you want the fire to be burning if you're getting lots of black smoke then something isn't right you're not doing it right now you have to be fairly physically fit and you have to be relatively nimble because as we get this locomotive going you're gonna have to climb around some right now what Ryan's doing is he's opened these non-return valves which are part of the injector system so you gotta get up there you gotta move stuff around and oh don't forget to turn on the whistle gotta have that whistle on don't you now when we turn something on you turn it all the way to the end and then a quarter turn back now you want to wear clothes that you can get dirty because part of your job is climbing around oiling and greasing stuff this is the mechanical lubricator another thing that we have to fill every day and oh no we overfilled it oh well actually you overfilled it about half the time that's why you want to have clothing on that you don't care about getting dirty and the, one of the last things we do before we go out of the shed is we turn on the air compressor and you want to make sure that you get all the food water out of it make sure that you leave the drains open long enough and now it's time to take the locomotive out of the shed here we go for another day of train riding now that we're outside the first thing you're going to do is you're going to check the water taking on water is an everyday event we use about 10 gallons of fuel per mile and about 100 gallons of water per mile now on our normal day when we're doing three round trips we generally only have to water up once if we do more than that a lot of times we'll have to water up twice we do add chemical so part of your job will be understanding how much chemical and how much water and keeping an eye on things now you're probably thinking a nice romantic water tower like you see in the movies yeah that'd be nice but the fact is no that's not what we use our means of getting water is pretty basic we use a plain old-fashioned fire hydrant gives us a nice unlimited amount of water so that's that's a good thing maybe not as romantic but at least we have plenty of water now I mentioned earlier that you need to be relatively physically fit and relatively nimble part of your job is going to be doing some physical stuff like rolling up and moving the hoses another one of your job is checking the fuel level we generally only have to check it first thing in the morning it usually lasts a couple of days and this is the way that we move our fuel we have a tank car with a pump on it now you need to bring gloves you don't mind getting dirty and wearing clothes you don't mind getting dirty because inevitably you're gonna get oil on you it just happens and this is the top here this is what it looks like the tank in the middle is for the oil the tank around the outside is for the water now this is called an injector the injector enables us to put water into the boiler when the boiler is under pressure you open up the water valve which was the bottom one and then you move that top lever towards you which enables the injector to pick up and start forcing water down into the boiler you do this all day long time and time and time again this is part of your everyday activity now since it's part of your everyday activity let's see it again you open the water up you pull the injector just a little bit to get it going and then you pull it forward and you can hear it you can tell when it's picked up the water and it's pushing the water into the boiler and generally I like to turn the water down a little bit so it takes it longer to fill 
That way it doesn't affect the temperature so much. And we don't want more than five pounds reduction in the boiler when you're adding water. All right, now you have a pretty good idea of what the bells and whistles, all the valves and levers and gauges and stuff do in the back head. We're going to start getting into the good stuff now. We're going to start talking about actually firing the machine. Now between being a fireman and an engineer, I like being a fireman about 51% and I like being an engineer about 49%. Yes, the engineer has the wow factor. Oh wow, I'm driving a steam locomotive. Yeah, that's nice, that's nice. But during your time as a fireman, that's actually more of an art form. You gotta understand what's needed being a fireman. What's required to make fire? Well, you have to have heat, fuel, and oxygen. Anytime your fire's acting up, it either needs more of one of those things or it needs less of one of those things. And we'll be playing with the different combinations. The real difference between a fireman and a good fireman is he's able to make the fire sing, make it do what you really want it to do. And you want to get in the habit, if you want to be a good fireman, of asking, what does the fire need? What do I need to give it? Now, I'm sure you've seen those pictures, those beautiful pictures of steam engines with big billowy clouds of black smoke. Bad fireman. Bad. Bad fireman. That's a sign that the fire is not happy. What you should have for smoke coming out of the smokestack is a very light, light gray haze. Anytime you see big billowy clouds of black smoke, that's a bad fireman, or else he was told to do it because they want to take pictures. Yeah, you know, you got to do what you're told to do. So let's go inside and let me start introducing you how to be a fireman. All right, it's time to talk about my personal favorite side, the fireman side. You know, I like driving the trains, but I like firing a little bit better because there's always something to do. You always have to be working on something. And the first thing you got to worry about all the time is how much water is in the boiler. Because if you get too much, well, you're going to suck it up and uh, it's not good. And if you get too little, it's going to blow up. So you don't want the boiler to blow up. And the way you keep it from running out of water is the, well, of course, the injector that we've talked about a couple of times. Yeah. As we talked about earlier, you open the water valve a little bit. You pull the injector rod, oh, okay, well, you got to make sure that it's working because if you don't, it's going to be blowing steam out all over the place. And you want to make sure you don't bring the pressure of the boiler down more than 5 PSI. It damages the boiler, and so you got to do it very carefully. Okay, and then, okay, you turn it off, and then you turn the water off because some of the injectors will keep throwing water on the ground. Let's do it again. So, this is one of the most important things that you do as a fireman. Open the water, open the injector, watch the pressure gauge, make sure the pressure doesn't come down how much? More than about 5 PSI. And I like to turn down the water volume like Ryan just did. Well, he did a little too far. And uh, the reason being that it will take longer to fill, which is easier on the boiler. Well, of course, you got to remember to check if there's water in the tank in the tender. Okay, another thing you got to work on is a hydrostatic lubricator. This lubricates the compressor, and it's your job to make sure that the drops are going just the right amount of times per minute. And, of course, your most important single job well, maybe not the most important one, but one of them is to make sure to keep the pressure the right amount so the engineer can make things work. And how do you do that? Well, you control the amount of fire. You make sure that the fire is happy, and we'll talk a lot about happy fire. You can add oil, subtract oil, add air, subtract air, blower, atomizer, all kinds of things that you can do back and forth. That's your job. Because, well, if you don't have fire, you don't have steam, and if you got big black smoke, you're not going to make friends of the local people. You got to make sure, okay, lean it out, lean it out, okay, think about, add some air, add some blower, a little less oil, okay, okay, hey, that's looking a whole lot better, look at that. 
Look at that. That's what I want to see. When you come here, I want to see that. Okay, so here we go. The hardest part of being a good fireman is starting and stopping. The running, well, that's not so hard. Let's see how he does here. Starting and stopping, the hardest part. Let's watch the stack. Hmm, look at okay, look at okay. Notice that the cylinders are venting. Yeah, it looks okay. I like that. And what do you do? You go from one thing to another as a fireman. You look at the fire, look at your controls, and you look up at the stack. Uh, okay, uh, it's a little smoky, okay. Then you go back to your pressure, go back to your water, go back to your fire, then you go back to your controls. Do you see a pattern here? Then you go back to your stack. Now, here is typical fireman. Oh, it's me. Eh, not typical. I'm starting to put some water in the boiler, and I'm checking around and around and around. And what you do is just again and again and again, check to make sure the stack, the pressure, the water level, the fire, the controls, stack, back and forth and back and forth. If you have to make an adjustment, then you make an adjustment. But only one thing at a time. You make one adjustment, wait and see what happens, because sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And you go around and around and around and around all day long. You're never out of things to do. It's actually great fun. So, what do you think? Is it going to work? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, oh, too much. Oh, too much oil. Okay, cut it down. Cut it. Oh, give it a little blower. Okay, okay, okay. It's better. Okay. Let's open the damper a little bit. Hmm. Oh, quite a bit better. I like that. I like that a lot. Being a fireman's fun. You get to do a lot of stuff. And, well, it's fun. Well, learning how to fire is always fun. And there's lots of things to pay attention to. But we're up to the big banana now. It's time for me to show you how to actually drive the steam locomotive. First thing to take into consideration, the engineer and the fireman can either play together nicely or they can really make each other's day miserable. Every time that the engineer adjusts his throttle, it's going to change the boiler pressure and the fire. Every time the fire and the boiler pressure changes, the throttle is going to have to be changed. So you can go back and forth and back and forth. You can either work together nicely or you can work together very poorly. This is one of the big things. Now keeping that in mind, you also have to be doing all kinds of other stuff. You have to be watching where you're going. You got to be watching the grade crossings. You got to be blowing the whistle. You got to be watching the water pressure and the water level and you got to be watching the fire and make sure there's no smoke coming out and you make sure that you're not exceeding the speed limit and you got to know what's coming up in the next area of track and of course a paramount importance you don't want to knock anybody down so you want to be very gentle as an engineer let's be gentle here so let's go back into the cab here let's talk about at least some of the basic concepts of driving the steam locomotive come on let's go well, here we go. We're going to start talking about actually driving the steam locomotive. There's a lot of things to think about already, but hey, this is what we started out to want to do. Now, as you run a steam locomotive, it is not like driving your car. You don't just press in the gas or press in the brakes. Everything has to be thought of well ahead of time, and everything has to be easy. If you yank on anything, it's not going to work. Well, except for maybe the whistle. Remember, you're going to have to blow the whistle at every crossing and for any particular reason where something's in the way. So you're going to be blowing the whistle. You don't want to blow everybody's head off, though, because it can be exceedingly loud. Of course, you're going to be having to check the water glass. Sometimes we'll be using the tricocks, but uh, not too often. They're kind of an old-style technology. Of course, you're going to be using the two different brakes. The top one is the locomotive brake, and the bottom one is the whole train brake. Of course, you're going to be using the reverser a lot. And you're going to be watching the water and the pressure. That's all part of your job, too. And this is the horn pull. Every locomotive has a horn pull someplace or other. 
The throttle you're going to be very gentle with. A little bit of movement on the throttle does a lot. Now watching the brake here, the train brake, with this particular type of brake stand, it's a number six brake stand, you have to work it back and forth. And with the reverser, think of it as a gear shift. Forward and reverse, and don't forget, you got to open and close those cylinder cocks to let the fluid water out. Now you also have a second injector on your side which may or may not be needed. As we start we open up the cylinder cocks and you blow some of the steam out which takes along with it all of the liquid water. This is every time you start not just when you feel like it. And here you can see the steam coming out of the bottom of the piston, comes out of the drive piston. And the upper piston is for moving the steam back and forth. Now with the reverser, if you put it all the way forward, it lifts up the rocker. That's what happens when you put it in. And then pull it back. If you push it all the way forward, you can think of it as first gear. As you move it towards the center, that would be second or third gear. This is a power reverser, so it's not real hard. I think 1932 Congress mandated that all locomotives above a certain weight would have one of these power reversers on it makes life well it's not like easy easy it's not like driving your car but it's way easier than you'd think and here's the rocker in action watch that rocker go back and forth and back and forth what it does it works on the timing for the valve that allows the steam to go into the piston let's see that again you'll see the rocker going back and forth and it's affecting the way the timing piston, the up and upper piston, is going in and out, adjusting where the steam goes. Now when you're using the throttle, little increments, little bitty increments, you got to move it a little bit and wait and see what happens. Remember that the steam has a long ways to go to where it starts doing something. You also want to keep in mind that every time you change your throttle, it changes the fire. And every time the fire changes, it changes the pressure. And every time the pressure changes, it affects your throttle. Everything's hooked together here. So make sure to move your throttle very easily and make sure to let the fireman know that you're going to be changing it. There's also an area right at the very beginning that nothing happens. And we'll play with that and give that feeling. A lot of times you're going to be needing to do more than one thing at a time. Notice that he dropped the brakes and added a little throttle. This is all going on at the same time. It's a little dance between slowing it down, speeding it up, and keeping it where you want it. Most all locomotives will go faster than the track allows. More than anything, you're usually keeping the locomotive from running away. You don't want to get it too fast. You're also going to have to be adding the whistle and talking on the radio. So you got all these different things. That's the train brake again. That sets all the brakes everywhere. That's the locomotive brake, which sets just the locomotive, or you can set the train brake and then drop the locomotive. So you can have either just the locomotives, just the train, or everybody set with the brakes. How much brake you're going to set? Well, it depends on what the situation is. And there you see he's bailing off or releasing the brakes on the locomotive. The reason you want to do that is to keep everything stretched out so the cars don't bang into each other. And here he is using just the locomotive brake. You set it on a little bit, drop it off, set it on a little bit, having a fine soft hand on all of these controls. If you get rough with it, you're going to be knocking people down. And every single time that we stop, you got to go out and do all the oiling and walk around and check everything. So it's just part of the job of the engineer, getting out there, being in touch with your machine. I don't know about you, but I certainly have a lot of fun being an engineer. So that's the nickel story. There's more to it, of course, but this is a good first introduction for you.
Well, that was fun. You've got the basics down on how to run a steam locomotive. It's time to start talking about some of those advanced features, some of those advanced control concepts. Because being a good locomotive engineer, it's all about finesse. Now, as you start to become better at driving a steam locomotive, you want to be very soft. Soft on the brakes, soft on the throttle. Keep in mind that freight guys, well, they bang stuff around. Sometimes a little bit too much. Sometimes they even break knuckles, which is way more than what we want to do. Remember, the knuckle is the thing that holds the cars together. What we want to do, considering that almost all steam locomotives are used in tourist operations, which means people, you don't want to knock the people down, so you want to be very, very gentle. And probably the single most important aspect of being a good steam locomotive engineer is knowing your track profile. What a track profile is, is what the track's going to do. Is it going to be going up? Is it going to be going down? Is it going to be a curve? Is it going to be a big grade, small grade, tight curve, easy curve? Curve with a grade? What's it going to do? And how long is your train? What's it going to happen? Because if you've got a long train, you're coming up a grade, you've got to give it some power, and then you start going down the other side, but the first part's down and the second part is still coming up. So there's a lot of fine aspects. Wherever you're going to go and play with steam locomotives, make sure to take the time and the effort to get to know the track profile, because that'll make you about a thousand times better than anybody else that is showing up to try to learn how to drive that steam engine. So let's go back into the cab. Let me show you some fun stuff. Come on, let's go. Of course, some of the more advanced techniques you probably won't come across right away, but there are some things that you can think about before you show up. Probably the single most important thing to prepare yourself to be a good locomotive fireman or engineer is to know the track profile. What's coming up? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is there going to be a curve? Because it's always harder with a curve. And if you have a curve and an up, an upgrade, well, that's going to be even harder. Same holds true going down. Now, yes, being a railroad kind of guy, even just for a day, requires some work. You got to actually do some stuff. You're going to get dirty. You have to be relatively physically fit and relatively agile because there are some things that need to be done every single day. And there's some things you need to keep track of. You need to watch the pressure all the time, of course. You have to understand the balance between the water level and the injector because those are things that are always important. And using the brake and the throttle is always a little dance. But if you don't know your track profile, you'll be fighting with the fireman all the time, and the fireman will be fighting with you all the time. Keep in mind that every time that you change the throttle, it's going to affect the fire. Every time the fire changes, it's going to affect your throttle. If you all of a sudden yank back on the throttle, you're going to get big billowy black clouds. If you accelerate too much, well, then you're not going to have enough steam. It'll suck the steam right out of it. So getting back to the idea, how do you do a good job of things? You need to know what's coming up. What's going to be around the corner? What's coming up? We're going to have a little bit of an upgrade, a little downgrade. Add a little bit of brake. Maybe add a little bit more of the throttle. If you can be more proactive, in other words, planning ahead, your driving of a locomotive will be way better, way smoother, way more efficient. If you're reactive, if you wait until something's already happening, it's almost always too late. And you have to be planning ahead. What's coming next? Well, right now I'm thinking, hmm, well, we're getting in close to the depot. But I'm going a little bit too slow. Rather than stalling the train, I'm adding a little more power to it, a little more steam. And notice how easy I'm moving the throttle. Just a little bit of a bump. And then when you turn it off, you turn it off. Did you see that foot action behind me? I was opening the cylinder cocks to make sure that there's no moisture building up in there. Well, working the railroad's way good fun, and we would love to have you guys come and join us. So... Have fun. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Well, there you had it. 
We've had a lot of fun learning about the steam engine, learning about firing, learning about how to drive it. Hope you guys had as much fun as I did. I just had a kick out of putting this video together. If you really want to have some fun, why don't you come and join us at the Oregon Coast Scenic Railroad. We're all a bunch of volunteers here. We get people that come in from all over the country. Some come for two days a summer. Some come for two days a month. Some come for two days a week. Some people like myself, I'm there three or four days a week, all summer long. And you can come and join us. You start out as a car host, which basically means you keep kids from falling out and you help the people on and off their train. Then we'll train you to be a conductor. From there, we'll train you how to be a fireman. And then if you have an interest and have the time and want to do it, we'll train you how to be a locomotive engineer also, a steam locomotive and also a diesel locomotive engineer. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode, a very special episode of Murphy's Welcome to My World. I'd love to have you come by, say hello. So come back and join us anytime, either here at YouTube or else in real life. Have fun, come and see me sometime. Bye now.